Hello. Hi How there. Good. Hi there. Good morning. Um, doing pretty good. Just a, a little bit worse for wear because I um, I went for a run uh, for the first time in a while uh -huh. and uh, might have overdone it a little bit. Uh, so okay. coming down the stairs has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's my only complaint <laughs> no. did, did you post you posted this yesterday pretty pretty late right this uh this meeting now this meeting invite i scheduled it about a, a week ago oh, okay, uh okay. and then so it it it's a older invite and then uh updated <clears throat> it or just reposted it uh last night before it turned in supposedly uh leonard is driving oh car, so. Okay, that's that's whatever cool. that means. All right. <laughs> but she says he's gonna try to. I guess he's gonna try to join because he just texted me. So send me the link because I'm driving. I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. No. And and you know, it's uh, if if it's uh, inconvenient, no no problem. We can always meet some other time. Um, I was I was hoping that that you might want to uh, if there's anything in particular that you wanted to highlight about the uh, chapter, and explain to people. Uh, that, uh, that this would be a really good opportunity to, to do it. Because uh, we talked about a couple of different uh, aspects in detail of the of the specification a week ago, uh, but there's lots but, more in there, um, especially with the, like the changes to polar codes and the, and you had uh, some, some, <clears throat> some uh, control, like the signaling, control signaling for, for payload a, I believe, is That's is right. coming along, but the payload B, it sounded like you had a different, um, you were anticipating kind of a different format for the controls for the control signals for payload B, uh, and I don't know if that's if that's come along any further than than last week, but but maybe you might uh, want yeah. to talk about your you know, like your vision for think, for that. I think, yeah, I think I mean the kind of the, the vision period is that you know as you. As you are at the as you are at the beginning of the uh, uh, of the packet, you know there's certain control version that is that is very very well protected. And as you move on in the information, as you move on inside the packet, it's a little bit like there's more control information that becomes available to you for for the modem to know what it's doing. the The payload B is. Uh, supposed to be reasonably flexible you know it's supposed to be meant for i mean for the drone application but also meant for for other kind of wireless applications especially if if you're not in motion if, if you're not in motion um then what's typically done you know in 5g and and in, in, in 4g as well is that the receiver listens to how good the channel is and it con across the bandwidth of, of the signal and it conveys that back to the transmitter and the transmitter can then optimize what it's sending where it can you know in parts of the channel where the, the, the signal ratio is very good it can transmit more information than others where it, it, it can transmit less and so some of these um some of the things i've written into into payload a and the control information on payload a basically it's a scheduling where where would we want to put stuff in payload b payload b is really the the one that carries the, the bulk of the information. <clears throat> so some of the control information there in that payload A is really meant to schedule things in payload B and, um, and make things flexible and make things optimal in some way for, for high throughput because we all want high throughput, everybody wants high throughput. And, uh, and so that's what it's all about. Another thing that I did add is I started thinking more about the Mac, the media access controller. So there are some headers that are described in the spec, which, which deal with uh, explaining, you know, the, the, the kind of subheaders or Mac subheaders that, that will appear in that payload A, what they mean. And, and so that's kind of where, where I am right now is, is to explain that better. Okay, wonderful. And, um, so what are the two, would in your in your mind, what are the two corner cases where the most extreme uh, two use cases for for mm -hmm. this flexibility? In order to kind of like illuminate, like here's how flexible this really can be. What what's your goal right. for? Could you just tell us what the what the far outposts are? I think you know the the two the two extreme cases are basically when we do talk to a to a, to a drone that's moving very quickly. 
And it's basically impossible to know what the channel looks like on, in time to be able to have this feedback loop going. So in that case, you know, you're gonna have a pretty static coding scheme for everything across the entire signal bandwidth. You know, there's just one, it, we're just gonna use QPSK or we're gonna use 16 palm and then we're gonna have this kind of polar code and, and that's it. And it, we can't, we just take our best guess and it's very uniform. And uh, the other extreme cases where we where we are we simply are a little bit more stable, and we do know exactly what the channel looks like, and then we can start to, you know have this flexibility. So it's it's high flexibility in case we're not moving fast and and we're, we're kind of static, or when the drone is hovering, or or we just have two stationary transmitters or you know or terminals. And the other case is when we're moving very fast and. Uh, so okay. that's, those are the, that's, two, the two big corner cases. Yeah, it's extremely helpful. In in the case of these two two corner cases and everything in between that we want to cover. So it sounds like not just so it's not just Doppler. Doppler is a big component of uh -huh. of the speed, and but uh -huh. it's also the channel conditions. So I guess I could I could anticipate where the you might have a case where you're moving very quickly and then you're then you're hovering in when it's uh -huh. totally in the clear. Um, mm -hmm. But we also may encounter a lot of, if you're doing this in a high multipath environment, that's an additional right. thing that yes. your your spec also takes care of. It also addresses. In a way, in a way, it's addressed, I would say a little bit at the same time, because Doppler changes, you know, the Doppler shift changes your, your channel, your, your channel condition. And, and you need to have a certain, like, I should say, density of these reference signals, you know, so that you can realize how the Doppler is changing. And so whether the Doppler is changing your, your, uh, your frequency response or changing conditions in actually what the paths look like, at the end of the day, uh, the modem has to uses the same kind of techniques to, to, to resolve both. One thing that you can do, of course, is if you really have just a single line of sight, which, which I'm sure can happen in, in drones, and and the, the drone is moving very quickly towards you, away from you. Then you can you can estimate that that uh, Doppler shift, and you can subtract it, which which is something that you can't do if the paths are changing very quickly. You know, you can't compensate for that as easily. But if you do have a very, if it's just mostly Doppler, you can detect it and you can subtract it just to make the modem's life a little bit more to make the modem's life a little bit easier. Okay. Yeah, that makes that makes an intuitive sense in in your mind um what would be uh, a near-term good proof of concept or or demonstration like an over-the-air demonstration i mean because we're, we're working on getting mm -hmm. this to work over the air uh but do you have advice for uh for the people that are interested in implementing this like what would be the first step what would be a very good a useful demo I think you know, a, a very good first step would be to to basically send the preamble across you know across the air yeah. and receive it at the other at the other side. I think that's always the first thing. You know, can I? Because the preamble is not something that's really difficult to generate. We can even just uh, use a simulation, save it off in some kind of memory, and and make sure that the interface to the DAC and all that works, and that the transmission works and it comes back down, and we can receive it. And I would then suggest that the first things that we do is in the receiver at least is develop some of these detection devices you know can we detect the preamble um can we detect what the frequency offset is that kind of thing <clears throat> and then slowly work your way you know, on both sides or i guess the transmitter is the easier thing to develop first you know and then start developing the the, the fft based ofdm modulator and and make sure that the that we have all the glue logic and the state machines in place so that we can send it out all at once with proper timing. So I think that's kind of how it, I think it, it ought to unfold, you know, to, but to have some interesting interaction in the lab and use the hardware properly, you know, you could do, you know, just send the preamble and receive the preamble and see if you can detect it properly because it's a reasonable part of the exercise at the end of the day. You know, the, the OFDM modulation and demodulation are are a little bit, uh, of course, they, they must be there, but they're a little bit of a separate exercise. 
I would say. So maybe a good way to chop it up into pieces is to do it the way I just mentioned. Okay, good. I think we're on the right track then because that's what we started with uh, since it that, that is a, a, a pretty common design pattern for, for this sort of stuff. And since the, the all the preambles were, they looked like they were very stable and mm -hmm. un understandable part of the, the spec. Okay, so we'll okay. Keep, keep working on that. We've got we've got pretty good uh, handle on the transmit side with just some uh, the problems that we're we're having are what appears to be a a, a bug in um in the in the actual the the process the framework of the implementation and so we're working with with MathWorks about that and if mm -hmm. that doesn't resolve very quickly then we take evasive action and we just simply write a function and and go ahead and, and implement it and try to transmit it over, over the air mm -hmm. in the lab. So we should, I, I don't know when we'll be able to do that. If, if it happens in a week, that would be, or by next week, that would be pretty quick. Uh, and the receive side is lagging the transmit side because you're exactly right. Uh, for uh, for this particular the, uh, endeavor, uh, I think the transmit is, transmit is usually easier than receive and this yes. is no, no exception. <laughs> yes, there's no doubt about that. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, any any other uh, advice or, or guidance or anything that you would like to highlight about the, the specification? Um, I mean, nothing nothing else that, that is new, I would say. No, I don't think there's anything particularly that's new in it. <clears throat> well, it certainly is as a, as a big step forward. Uh, you know, so, so we, the lab folks uh, discussed it uh, on Monday and were delighted at the, the the additional uh, figures and diagrams and, and things like that. And so uh, it's uh, been received uh, very positively. Uh, and they they were confused about the page numbers. So I explained that mm -hmm. it's a chapter. Yeah, it's a <laughs> chapter. They like, in the book. Yeah, they were like, where's the other 800 pages of the spec? Uh, and I was like, no, 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 don't. Uh -huh. <laughs> have, no, that's not the, don't worry, you know, don't, don't uh -huh. stress out. And then, then, then thank you very much for clarifying the, the license and sure. the publishing and all that, because I was concerned sure. that we wouldn't be able to, to post it or share it. No. Uh, but it sounds like that's not a problem at all. And no, no. I mean, the, the spec really is just like, you know, Leonard and I had discussed, it's, it's supposed to be open source. The yes. spec's supposed to be open source. So whatever is, is going to be in my book is, that part is totally open. There's okay. no nothing to it, you know. I mean, I, I can't say that every, you know, everything that's in my head, you know, that will make it work should be open spec. But you know, right. like some secret sauce should be open spec. But definitely the specification should be open spec. Okay, yeah, that that made everybody feel very happy. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, we can. Your preference was for the MIT license. I mean, I'm not really familiar with uh, with any any of the license. I just heard of the MIT license a couple of times, and I, I guess it's I leave it up to your discretion. Okay, yeah, I'll I'll double check. I'm familiar with most of the major licenses, and MIT is certainly mm -hmm. one of them. And that that mm -hmm. be uh, that we can we can use it. I th I don't think it'll be a be a trouble at all. Um, the hardware implementation, like the what we're publishing for uh, for FPGA work, we're using CERN's uh, open hardware license, the version 2.0, because they uh, sort of targeted it and specifically included FPGA firmware mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. for written work like this then um i think the the mit license is most appropriate so we'll we'll go with that and i'll i'll make it yeah. as clear as possible it's, if it's okay with with both of you then then i can go ahead and upload the the update this this new the revision to the spec in in the uh in the right folder so mm -hmm. i can unless leonard I, I don't want to step on your toes if you wanted to uh to do that or handle that uh, you can, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. For some reason, my headset's not working quite right, but, um, so I'm in a closed office right now. The, um, yeah. So MIT, I think, uh, is, is appropriate. I don't know that much about the CERN license itself. Um, the MIT tends to be the most promiscuous and, um, meaning, uh, there's no requirement on the people that you know that receive the the code and all that so I, i'm not uh that familiar with the cern license uh, um itself i was actually thinking that the any code release would be mit as well but um 
Yeah, that's totally yeah, I okay. Think I think MIT would work for like the Python and everything. The the only reason I would I would invite you to to check out the CERN license, um, but because it it handles hardware. So anything that kind of touches hardware is in the past the open source licensing has been challenging and somewhat problematic, um, and and the only real difference uh, because it's a there's a very permissive CERN open hardware license as well. Uh, and I think that's the vibe that we want to match. Um, but that it's it's not um, a terribly different. So I think for for written work like this, the MIT license is totally fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know the difference between the CERN and the MIT. I mean, it's hard to imagine more permissive than MIT, though. Um, the yeah. So as far as you know, just putting it up there, I think uh, the, the version that you have, I mean, you can certainly put it up on GitHub and, and, um, okay. and is it, is that the newest one? The one that we talked about last week? Not very much has changed since then, but I mean, okay. I, I think it will continue to get updated and change. Okay. So like if, if, if Andre, <laughs> when Andrea sends out an update, it's okay to just go ahead and flow that into the to repository. Yeah. For okay. Me, okay. Okay. Then, uh, yeah, well, I'll, uh, I'll do that. So what happens like if, for certain things, like, you know, if I think of something for frequency hopping, you know, which is maybe not no longer like a commercial application, what happens then in that case, is that still, would that still be open source or would we have to start like doing a separate spec or, uh, I think it's up to you. If if you, because mm -hmm. your vision for this is cohesive, this is this mm -hmm. makes sense. This is a, you know, a, uh, essentially you know, we started with the physical link uh, specification. Mm -hmm. If you had a variant in mind, um, mm -hmm. and 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 if you felt like it started to kind of outgrow or kind of pull this chapter off track, like. Then sure, you could you mm -hmm. could have a, a, a extension or a separate specification entirely and release that under the same uh, essentially the same license, either either a completely other mm -hmm. different repository or side by side with this. So it'd be, be up to you to like if you felt okay, well this is this is sort of based on this work, but now I'm looking at frequency hopping, and yeah, because frequency hopping starts to get into a different category of. Uh, of radio transmission, but there isn't any so re regulatory issue with with publishing it. Mm -hmm. There's there would be no objection. It would just be like if you mm -hmm. had a, a different idea or a variation, mm -hmm. and and you thought it needed a separate document, then we would just mm -hmm. have it in parallel. What about things like, for example, once you guys get further along in your implementation, uh, how much do you want your implementation to be open source? I mean. All of it. I think it's will great be. You know, that you guys. So yeah, we, I mean, just said, yeah, all of our work is open source. So we, that's, it's easy to answer your question because everything that we do is open process and also open result. So we, we show so people the intermediate mm -hmm. steps and try to uh, do this in order for learning and, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of show how the sausage is, is made. Uh, mm -hmm. So all of what we will be doing will be uh, open implementations. You guys never worry about, you know, people in, in God knows what China, Russia misusing certain things that you guys develop or, uh, or produce? It's a very good question. Uh, this comes up a lot. Uh, and mm -hmm. no, no, we 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 do not. Um, if because there's always the concern uh, from especially if you're coming from industry, which that's my background is industry and you're very concerned mm -hmm. about people stealing your work, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or, or profiting off of your endeavors this means you need to keep your work you know protected proprietary mm -hmm. secure obfuscated there's lots of different ways to try to do it uh, in the case of open source what we're doing is the exact opposite we would really like people to steal it and use it because then it becomes the standard way of doing things and yes uh this means that you're open to abuse and people taking your work and not paying it back like not mm -hmm. giving you either credit or donating back uh whatever mm -hmm billions of dollars they make on your <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. or thousands or hundreds of dollars that they make on your thing but the uh the uh, sort of the open source mindset is is in, sort of we're resilient to that that's it's a uh, part part of the deal uh and then yeah it could be 
could be adopted and, and used. Uh, and that is uh, not a not something that would stop us. So mm -hmm. the, having it totally open like this is a, a deliberate choice and is made mm -hmm. uh, understanding and accepting that sort of uh, potential repercussion. You know, um, and yeah, I mean, we can see that this happens. The the mm -hmm. ideas about intellectual property. There's a mm -hmm. tremendous diversity around the world. Um, a diversity even just amongst uh, your personal network, probably, you know. So I hope hope that's, I know that's not a, like a, a kind of, I don't know, is, is it an answer? It's the best answer I, I can give you is that oh, yes, our eyes are completely wide open. Yes, this happens mm -hmm. to open source. It gets ripped off all the time. Um, but on the good side, the, the work being adopted, an open standard and an open process, open designs, that leads to that particular thing uh, being more widely adopted, and that mm -hmm. means that your, you know, views, your ideas, uh, then become essentially a standard. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is a more powerful thing and a better thing overall. Uh, rising tide lifts all boats, and having designs that are solid and good and dependable uh, will help everybody, including commercial uh, endeavors. Mm -hmm. We hope that we hope it's used. And go ahead, take it and run with it. I think one of the other aspects, the one of the other motivations for doing this is to increase community capability. So if there's uh, sort of like a return on, on capability, and if you have a lot of people that are now looking at this sort of stuff and seeing it sometimes for the first time, um, and that you can you can kind of convince them that yes, this is this is how it's done. Uh, then overall, our overall quality everywhere uh, raises, and you're not stuck with having commercial implementations that are broken in some way, or or limited, and and that you you don't have a, a stagnation of, of talent. So mm -hmm. again, that helps everybody, including uh, commercial work. Okay. If there is anything that needs to be um, Proprietary. I, I mean, I can't think of anything in the in this in this realm unless we started to wander into uh, uh, innovations that that say cellular decided were theirs. You know, and that's always a concern when you're doing um, advanced or current or modern work in open source mm -hmm. uh, is that you are bumping into people and and making them uncomfortable. However, because we publish as we go and we've opened the process completely, we can show that we have not stolen work. We're not cribbing from mm -hmm. a company or stealing it. We came about this on our own from first principles. Mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of the, the, I guess that's a defense, almost like a, a, a way to say, you know, here we've, we've, we've shown all of our work and, uh, and will that protect you in all cases? Well, no, because there's there's no, there's no sure sure bets in uh, in intellectual property at all. Another mm -hmm. area of concern is there are uh, there are technologies that are identified as very sensitive. Um, synthetic aperture radar would be one of them. So anything that sort of kind of starts to look like that, we have to be very cautious uh, because those are are things that uh, not even uh, openly publishing uh, may completely protect us from. I don't think we're running into synthetic aperture radar here. Um, mm -hmm. No, but yeah. there are technical areas that are that are sensitive, and the DoD will talk to you. So mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, and anything that that you're working on that you want to implement that's a that's like if you were uh, you I say you not sorry mm -hmm. not trying to mm -hmm. single you out anybody that's taking this work and wanting to make an implementation that's proprietary. Good, we're glad mm -hmm. we helped. Please, uh, mm -hmm. you know, then uh, kick kick us back some. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some love and uh, preferably a couple of donations and we'd be we'd be thrilled so mm -hmm. that's that's kind of our attitude is is to to just improve the the state of the art uh, and we believe that open source is the one of the quickest and best ways to to get uh, uh, code and designs out there that are <clears throat> solid and reliable mm -hmm. that's good all right Leonard, did you have anything to to talk about? Uh, no, not really. Um, 
Yeah, yeah no, uh, not really. I'm just really kind of trying to uh, pick up this spec again, thinking about hardware implementations. Uh, specifically, I talked to Andreas over the weekend about uh, polar codes and potentially how we're going to um, do that. Um, and that that's about it. I really haven't done very much more than that. Okay. Yeah. Everyone's really excited about polar codes. So that was a, a, a very positively received. So, and also the, I, I passed along or tried to represent the, the goal uh, about it being able to switch in codes, like as much as possible for a particular implementation. It's like, okay, if you want this forwarder correction, you can, if you want this one, you can. And because usually designs, I'm going to say, kind of go with one forward error correction, and it ends up getting designed in in a way that is really kind of embedded in the whole thing. And it's it's refreshing to hear uh, someone say, "Oh, well, you know, if you if you want to use so not just a different rate of code like we see in adaptive mm -hmm. coding and modulation, but the ability to if you can take the spec and you if you have a, a some other sort of need, or if there say there was a big innovation in forward error correction that this would be something that you could um you could update with less less tiers uh, than some other specs so that was that was some feedback from monday yeah. Yeah. cool okay no we're good um and on and our... i think the spec, the spec also does something else which uh, Leonard sort of insisted on is that we have a couple you know we have these um at the beginning where it defines what this error correction is uh, which is a signal field that there's a couple of different formats and you know there's some we allow for four formats we've defined two of them and the other two can somebody else can make up their own mind yeah <laughs> also, yeah i thought one. that was great that's that's always a good thing to see you know it just mm -hmm. it shows the sensitivity towards uh towards the whole specification process so mm -hmm. that was that was really fun and it's going to spark um discussion mm -hmm. and 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 hopefully uh, in the long term, some some innovations mm -hmm. that'd be really nice. And I guess there's the possibility that somebody could come along and just not have any forward error correction at all. They could just simply not implement it whatsoever if they wanted to. Um, I'm kind of in the camp of like, yay, forward error correction is kind of necessary, uh, you know. But but that got that got raised as a question. Yeah. So usually there's. Um... Like in the SDA spec, um, th there's the SDA spec for, I think, tranche one or whatever, it, they define, they're using LDPC, and um, they define, uh, let's say, four different encoding rates plus none. And in the header field, basically, it, it, they tell, you know, it, it tells you what the encoding is. Um, so if they bypass it, they it's all enumerated. So it's enumerated as zero. And I think, I, I don't know how many bits they re allocate for that, but it's enumerated as zero. So if it's not FEC, then then that's in the header field. So in the payload, you know not to apply, you know, FEC to set up the receiver that way. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, obviously that could be done in, in the rate section, right? So there's, I think, uh, the spec has a, you know, a couple of unused values. So zero could certainly be mean bypassed, you know, FEC. Um, I, while I, while it's on my mind though, I did want to have a question for you on your, um, on your MATLAB uh, Simulink implementation. So uh, just whenever you're ready. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, um, in there, you're, you're in the one that's uh, checked into the repo right now. Uh, there's these, I think it's an IFFT block and, a, and a, maybe an FFT block. But if you do not have the um, HDL code, or I believe it comes up as you don't have that toolbox. Um, so number, my first question is, did, did we need that there? I wasn't I wasn't necessarily sure if we needed that block in for what we're doing and 
Um, number two, is there a way to get around it as well? <laughs> you know, other than um, logging in. So I have just kind of the standard MATLAB with the DSP, you know, tools and all that, but not the HDL. Okay. Yeah, I can, I think I can answer that. The, yeah, we're going to need the IFFT block. Uh, and in order to to produce the HDL code and publish uh, a body of, of HDL, like here's the HDL design for this model. Yeah, HDL coder is, is required. This is another reason why we use the CERN license because it's uh, it covers these cases. So the the reason why the CERN open hardware license was um, was proposed and, and revised is to to handle the very common case of expensive uh, you know vendor tools like Vivado, Simulink, MATLAB, you know uh -huh. all the you know all, and all the other ecosystems, um, and to say as long as you can get it, as long as you can obtain it, you might have to buy it, you may have to pay uh money for it um that as long as as a sort of a reasonably engaged person can go and get these tools and get these libraries and get these things that your design is licensed as open source so there i would say no there there isn't really an alternative for this particular ifft block because that's the one that's from the hdl coder library it's already optimized for for hdl uh creation um now, what Talak is working on is because he found a, a, a an app note in a paper that has some improvements in with respect to latency for IFFT, and this is pretty exciting because the IFFT block in HDL Coder looks like it's right up the middle. It's a standard IFFT block; it behaves just like they all do, and the the sort of latency improvements that that he found, which I believe relate to um, the reverse bit ordering. So, how you do that is a is a pretty standard thing. You you manipulate your bit order for the ind indices of your IFFT, and there's been some innovations there. So he was like, I will go re write a, I'll go investigate this and implement um, maybe an, an alternate IFFT, and we can put them head to head. We can make a design. You know, here's the implementation with the IFFT from HDL Coder, and here's mine, and whichever one has a lower latency kind of wins. And I was like, I'm all in. That that sounds great. Go do it. Um, so that's what he's working on. And I, I'll, I'll check back in with him. And there's some progress there. He got the app note and the application, the example application from Altera. So it's you know Altera and their ecosystem. And he's looking through the source code to make sure that it doesn't rely on like an Altera specific thing because we're using Xilinx parts. Um, so. That's the sort of stuff that we're kind of looking at. So yes, you'll need HDL coder, but in the, the second part of the answer is HDL coder and Simulink and MATLAB are a means to an end. So this isn't where the design ends. This is, we're using a model-based design approach and we're trying to produce a body of work. And as soon as we get the body of work, this is an HDL design that is then published separate, you know, as a, as a repository, you check that out directly, then Okay, all of this MATLAB Simulink stuff is now, I'm going to he hesitate to say this, but we set it aside. We go, okay, this is the design that we used, or this is the model that we used to create the HDL. Now we have the HDL, and now you are, you're going to have to directly edit and manipulate that. You're going to have to, you, now you own it. So you now own this body of work, and it will, it will be a lot of code. Uh, just just generating the HDL for the IFFT block alone is quite a bit, but it's all pretty understandable. You can sort of you can see the structure. It is very human readable. This is high quality uh, HDL, so it's a uh, it's good. They they did a good job. As long as you stick to HDL blocks like this IFFT block or the NCOs or all the other stuff, uh, the resulting uh, created HDL code is not only yours to publish however you see fit and open source is totally okay, uh, but also not bad. It's uh, it's human readable. If you put in uh, comments in their model, they come out in the HDL. So there's a lot to like, um, but there, your objections and, and, and what your, and your, your critique is, is heard and, and, and legit. Yes. You have to have something that is, uh, not easily obtainable. That's why we went to all the effort to get a nonprofit 
variant of the license. That's why, you know, the, and we make it available to anybody that, that will go through the trouble of getting an account on our virtual machine in remote labs. So you can use every last toolbox. We have all of them, including HDL coder, LTE, the GPU stuff, all of that. All you got to do is, is show up and, and log in, get an account, and then, and then it's up to you to look at it with, to deal with the uh, learning curves that sometimes feel like a wall uh, on on getting this stuff to uh, to simulate and and to you know debugging your particular model. Uh, so we're we're trying very hard to make the tools accessible, but also to move past this point where we're mired in the model. We'll be here for a while figuring this stuff out and getting our hands around it. What we want is to create the HDL, the source code. And then that is the the locus of interest. That's the the locus of control. That's what we're really after publishing. I know that was a really long answer to your great question. Is is that is that good? Yeah, no, no, no that's good. Um, uh, yeah. So you might want to ask Talak if um, basically. So he's I th he found a an approach to doing IFFTs and FFTs and. It sounds like uh, from what you just said that he's going to try to go directly to H to an HDL like Verilog or VHDL, whatever. Yeah, um, and then then that so block the, would be. The question it, is, yeah, is if, this, if it works, then that block it, is backported so this, into the I'm model. Not with the question, hold up. Oh, sorry, I thought you were. Yeah. So if if he can uh, take well, rather than going directly to HDL or take the HDL and come up with um, one of those dot m files that you can put in uh simulink uh there's a sp very specific way you need to code it and and in a coded in a way that it actually does put out a hdl um that would actually be kind of helpful for uh, the project as well i believe i'm sorry what was the question um yeah so could you ask uh talak if if he can uh Rather than just jumping in and producing HDL right off the get-go, come up with a .m file, a MATLAB file that is Simulink compatible and also compatible to generate HDL. That way, um, we can compare side-by-side -side simulations in Simulink. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not. Sh okay. I, let me read. Try to read it back to you. Um, so his his investigation is is mathematical, and he's uh, attempting to understand a uh, an HDL implement or example, it's an application note from Altera, and I found it really interesting. It was like, oh, cool, you know, you think you know IFFTs and FFTs, and it's uh, plug and chug, and there's there's always little things to to look at, and and this was uh, this was an exciting example. Um, so I. I think his goal is is understanding it and and to to walk through it and to kind of prove that it is actually a reduction in latency that it delivers it for our particular requirements like the size of the IFFT the size of the you know the, what we're what we're working with so in terms of like asking him to produce something that that is compatible with Simulink that is um that might be achievable because because as far as I know and from what I've done myself, you have a a function in MATLAB that you then encapsulate. You put it inside of a function block and you can put that into uh, into Simulink. And then you and that's hope I'm hoping that's what I can eventually get. Um, and then then that that's a good comparison within Simulink. Now, does that produce HDL code? It's supposed to, uh, you know, but but we have a a, kind of a speculation step on top of a speculation step here, so I, I won't be able to re to assure you that that's what's going to pop out on the other side, because Talak is kind of interested in just going straight to the HDL and and writing an HDL implementation. <laughs> it'll be in Altera, and then it'll check it in Altera, probably with model sim, and then provide here it is. Here's the here's the result. Now either one of those things would be good, but from a from biased as a model-based design person, it'd be great if I could get them to do all that work to have a block and simulate. Um, there's a limit to to what I can expect from somebody that's a, 
graduate student and very busy. <laughs> so I'll take whatever I can get. And if he if he gets on fire, catches fire with the HDL implementation, I'll take that. Um, and if he can can produce a, a, a MATLAB function up for all of this, and and then we can run it through Simulink and do the things that that you're interested in, then then I'll certainly help with that. Uh, so so I guess the answer is we'll see, and I'll 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 see what I can do. There was another thing that he found. He found a paper that talked about cyclic uh, suffix instead of cyclic prefix, and that reduces latency um, in some cases because uh, it kind of depends on the length of your. It depends on the length of your symbol, right? So, and the cyclic prefix itself, the length of that depends on your channel. Uh, so there's lots of slop here, but in the examples in the in the things that he found, it was. Uh, up to like a in between a 25% and 50% latency reduction if you use a cyclic suffix instead of waiting for the entire thing you know putting doing a prefix means more waiting more buffering more waiting and so he was curious as to if we could possibly look at doing a cyclic suffix rather than a cyclic, cyclic prefix because the math is the same it still lets you do a circular convolution nothing changes it, for the math, it's just a, an improvement yeah. in latency. So, so I, I think, bet... yeah, I think the idea is, I mean, all the industry uses prefixes at this point. Right. So for, yeah. He, we were curious as to like, mm -hmm. well, that's interesting. You know, it, surely right. it can't be this simple. Maybe. So, if you have and some, I guess the other the other thing you guys should think about is like, you know, the or there are many OFDM symbols that come in at the end of the day, right? So. Let's say you have a prefix, and let's say that does increase latency for some reason. Uh, you know, you're working on decoding and doing stuff with the OFDM symbols as they come in, and then really it's just the last OFDM symbol in that case that that has some kind of delay associated with it. But it's five microseconds. You know, it's it's not like something big. Um, so I don't know. I I I don't I don't see how you know, technically you could say, oh, maybe it could reduce latency, but. Um, oh, well, because you, know, you, like, you never mm -hmm. have this delay for any of the symbols. It's, it's, so it, it squishes, it's not just the last one that you're, that you're squeezing the delay down. You actually, the entire stream will shrink. Because I mean, you, yeah. you never have to wait for any of them. You can just send them out the door as quickly as possible. So it makes oh, sense, just, it, you know, when I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. It, you, know. you mean to get rid of the cyclic prefix entirely for the symbols and just have one big one at the end? Is that what you're saying? No, no, This it's a cyclic suffix so that you never have to, the symbol is never delayed. None of them ever get delayed uh, by that amount. It was really cool. I, I thought that it was a neat <laughs> result. If it's okay with you, we might, it, this is something that won't happen this week, I promise. <laughs> but I was, I was curious, what we'll, what we'll do is like, okay, once things are kind of working and we can get some prefixes, uh, the, the basics are, are in the Simulink model right now. So we're, we're able to add the cyclic prefix and, and everything's looking good. We got the math to work out and found a off by one problem and all that stuff stuff but you know later on when this is working over the air what i'd like to do is just to go ahead and try a cyclic suffix and then compare the two data streams um and see if what this paper talks about actually happens i mean you guys see no reason why not because it's uh, i'm not familiar with it so i mean you guys can try whatever you want to try okay it's, yeah um, we'll, we'll the go question ahead and... would be are they both compatible with each other is 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 one question in, in my mind. In the, yeah, um, no, it would it would not. I would say if you're well, okay, I take it, it back. Um, it may be. Um, does it matter? I think it does. I think you need to know whether the like in our case, eighty two symbols or eighty two samples are at the front or the back, where the repetition is. But actually, okay, if you if you designed the receiver smartly, with you know, if you if you said all you're looking for is a correlation just look for a correlation and then okay that's the in both cases it's the border it's the it's the boundary between your two symbols so there should be i'm gonna just intuitively say there should be a way to make a clever receiver that actually can handle both a suffix or a prefix and will deliver you the contents of the symbol it'll strip that off it'll use it 
to to do its cool math trick. It's really pretty amazing what it does. It's so neat. But here you go. Here's your 1024 back. So I'll I'll take it on on as a as a as a side thing to to kind of like suss this out. And um, this is this will be later on that we that we get to compare this. So. I think there's a way to do it where it doesn't matter. And if it does have a latency improvement, and since that's our our overarching goal with this with the spec is to deliver the lowest latency uh, signal that we can, that easy improvement uh, changing where the where the pre where the cyclic goes, you know, I think that might be a big win. Be pretty cool. I couldn't find any other commercial uh, system that had it. And um, that makes that makes me believe that there's a another reason why you wouldn't want to have a su a cyclic suffix. So I haven't found one yet, but I'll keep looking, and I look forward to to being able to uh, to dive in and and kind of get it get an A B comparison um, for for FlexLink. That's okay, all the questions I have. Yeah, I have to get going, so I'm going to sign off at this point. Yeah, I got to. I understand. Thank you so much for 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 coming, and uh, this is super exciting, and very very much looking forward to to continuing to to build it and and see this uh, wonderful spec get uh, it grow. It's a it's a big step up from the version eleven uh, that people have been mm -hmm. working with to this one. It's a it mm -hmm. is a big step forward. So everyone's uh, very cheered and and happy to see it. Cool. All right. Yeah, you have I'll lots. You, you have you have a lot of fans. So, <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. All right. See y'all on Slack. You. See you. Bye.